One of the most appealing characteristic to me that a person can have is humility. One of the most unattractive characteristics a person can have to me is ingratitude. It's important that we are thankful, and I want us to consider that this evening from the Word of God. We need to have a thankful life. When Jesus went into Jerusalem, was headed into Jerusalem, on his way there in Luke chapter 17, something very interesting happened to him. Let's read there. If you will, turn to Luke 17. We'll begin in verse 11. Now it happened as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. And so it was as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. A miracle had taken place on ten individuals who had a hideous disease, a dreaded disease, a, de a disease that caused the body to rot. It was a terminal disease, no cure, no. Jesus healed them of that. And out of the ten, only one came back to thank Jesus. So many are ungrateful. Let's consider why we need to have an attitude of gratitude, thankfulness to God. Jesus notices whether or not we're thankful to Him. I appreciate Brother Harley's prayer that we not take for granted our blessings. If we're going to be thankful, we cannot take those for granted. I want you to notice that these ten lepers, they were used to being far away from people. That's what the law dictated for them because it was a contagious disease. They lived together, but around people that did not have this disease, they were not supposed to get close. And when they see Jesus as he enters this place, they lifted their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, speaking loudly to get the attention of Jesus since they were not close. Jesus tells them to go show themselves to the priest. And on the way, we see they were healed. The Samaritan, he realized he was healed. He came back. He got close to Jesus then. He got close to Jesus. In fact, he got to Jesus' feet right there before Jesus. But he raised his voice even though he was close this time because he was so thankful for what God had done, and it says with a loud voice, he glorified God, fell down on his face and feet, giving him thanks. What a wonderful attitude. But Jesus asking about the others who had been healed as well. Where were they? God wants us to be thankful. It's important that we are the first thing I want you to consider on how we can have a thankful life is we need to learn to be content with what we have. As Americans in this country, we perhaps have more possessions than any other country in the world. And yet, at times it seems we are the least content, the least satisfied. The Israelites, God's special chosen nation, people who came from Abraham. A promise was made to him and they were very blessed. God brought them out of Egyptian slavery and we see when they got in the wilderness they were complaining that they had no food 
Yet we see in Exodus 16 that they did and God provided them that in a deserted place, a place that plants were not plenteous, a place unlike the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah as we talked about this morning at first, how they were garden-like. No gardens in this wilderness. But yet God provided for them and they were ungrateful. They complained. Those who oftentimes have plenty and God provides so much for, they seek riches and that becomes their lifelong goal is to have more than most people. They oftentimes, though, display an ungrateful heart, take for granted, come to expect that they should have so much. And Paul warns Timothy of this when he's preaching in Ephesus that was in the first century considered a wealthy city. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, that last chapter in 1 Timothy, verses 9 and 10, these are familiar to you, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for such some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It does not bring the satisfaction that they look for. They pierce themselves through with many sorrows. There's a, pe a lot of people, I think, that find out later on after they've acquired great wealth that it promised what it did not deliver. They were better off before they had what they had. The love of money we should not have. It is the root of all kinds of evil. Those who desire to be rich are falling into all kinds of temptation. Jehovah wants us to live a life of contentment. Jesus, in the heart of his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 25, said this, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one, one of them. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus says we're not to be warriors. These are people that he's talking about that will be citizens of his kingdom. You know, did you notice in every song that Tony led us in this evening, in every single song, there's so many reasons for us to be thankful if we're a part of the kingdom of God. Blessed assurance, we can live with that assurance. And it's going to be better after this life of trouble and burdens and woe and sadness and sickness. We have the opportunity to go to heaven. We can live with that assurance because of Jesus Christ. He is our king, we, we sing next. Jesus being our king, we are part of his kingdom. We are heaven bound and we can be thankful for that. And the third song, praise him, praise him, our blessed redeemer. We have hope because of Jesus Christ. So many reasons to be thankful. If you are a Christian, I don't care what's going on in your life and how difficult it may be, we have reason to be thankful. We are spiritually rich. It's important that we show contentment. And it, it's something that doesn't always come natural. It's something that is learned. 
The Apostle Paul speaks of it as being a learned thing in his life. And he wrote from prison in Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Contentment is learned. It's a mindset. It's something that we have to build in our lives. We should be more content now than we ever have been before. God provides to us what we need here. And he will provide for us in the life to come if we are obedient and faithful to him, a part of his kingdom. And Jesus delivers the church up to him in the end. And we will live with him. We will have joy beyond measure. In Psalm 84, verse 11, we see how God blesses us with the necessities of life. The psalmist writes in Psalm 84, verse 11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And you say, well, both the, the righteous and the unrighteous suffer here. And it sometimes it, it seems the unrighteous are prospering. You've got to stay focused on the life to come. What is beyond this life for those that are a part of his kingdom? He will not withhold from those who walk uprightly. And in Psalm 145 and verse 15, the eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. God takes care of us and we need to be content. We need to learn contentment. We also need to learn to be thankful. That doesn't always come natural. I think like contentment, thankfulness must be learned. Jehovah taught Israel thankfulness by having them offer the first fruits of the grounds produce. Did you realize that the reason, or one of the reasons they were told to give the first fruits was to create thankfulness within. God knows that's important. He wants that. He desires us to be thankful. And that's why uh, he had them to offer the first fruits of what they were blessed from the ground. In Deuteronomy 26, it expresses this. And pay close attention to this. Deuteronomy 26, beginning at verse 9. He has brought us to this place, Moses says to them, He has brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He's talking about the fact that they're going into the promised land. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. Then you shall set it before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. So you shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given to you and your house, you and the Levite and the stranger which is among you. You know, God didn't need those things. Everything belongs to God. But in our giving, we should realize how blessed we are from God. And I think the same way today, uh, on the first day of the week, as it instructs us to in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, to lay by and store, we should be cheerful givers because we're realizing that it's God that gives us these things and enables us to give. Are we grateful to God? It has to be learned. We need to teach our children to be thankful. If we don't, I'm afraid they're going to grow up thinking that the world owes them. That they're entitled. That they deserve things, the good things. You remember this morning in talking about a tale of two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened to them. I, I talked about how homosexuality is condemned in the New Testament. And we looked at Romans chapter 1. And we read way down in Romans chapter 1 towards the end where it talks about women uh, with women, men with men, and how that's unnatural, and, and how those things, uh, God hates those things. 
That's the end of the road. It leads to destruction. It leads to death. But the beginning of that road, what gets a person on the road such as that? Well, if you look back in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, because although they knew God, they did not glory, they, they did not glory Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile, and their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, that journey down that road of destruction that leads deep and deep into sin and perversion, it starts with an attitude of ingratitude, not being thankful to God, not recognizing Him for who He is and what He's done for us. Paul, in perhaps the last inspired writing that we have from him in 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, the first two verses, talks about What's going to happen in the latter times? And we're living in the latter times, the last days. And he, he, he writes this in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 and 2. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. People that are ungrateful, unthankful. That displeases God and it leads down a serious path and we need to open our eyes and see that and learn to be thankful for what God has given us. We are so blessed by Him. You don't have to read the Bible very often and know very much about it to see that the Bible teaches we're to have a thankful heart. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20, Paul said to that wealthy city of Ephesus, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many times do you read the writings of the Apostle Paul, these inspired letters, and he says, I am thankful, I am thankful, I am thankful. Paul, as a child of God, was thankful. Thankful to God. Thankful for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Thankful that he had the opportunity to suffer with Christ. Thankful for so many things. And he taught thankfulness to Christians. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18 he says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is God's will in Christ Jesus for you that you give thanks in everything. Give thanks. Learn to be thankful. And I think something that will certainly help us to have a thankful life is to remember your blessings from God. Why is it oftentimes when it comes to our blessings that we have short-term memory? God knows we need reminders. And on the first day of the week when we're assembled, we are to partake of the memorial and we're to remember. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus says, when he established the Lord's Supper. It's a reminder. There was a battle that took place in Mizpah between God's people and the Philistines. Look back in 1 Samuel chapter 7. This battle between God's people and the Philistines that took place in Mizpah, and that's a Hebrew word that means tower. God defeated the Philistines. It was clear that God defeated the Philistines on behalf of his people. A people that were asking for a king to be like the other nations. God was the king that went before them in battle and here defeated the Philistines on behalf of his people. And because of that, because of that, a stone was placed there as a memorial to remember what God had done for them, to remind them of what God had done for them, lest they forget a reminder, a stone. It was called Ebenezer. Ebenezer which means stone of help. In 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, 
We read, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. God has brought us here. We would not be here if it were not for God. He defeated the Philistines in the battle. And as a reminder of this, this Ebenezer, this stone, is placed here as a reminder that thus far the Lord has helped us. I want to take your minds to the mid-1700s in England. In the mid-1700s in England, there was a 17-year-old that had had a, a difficult life. His parents did not show a lot of love for him, and he rebelled. He lived in London, and he was in a gang, a rebellious gang, a very dangerous gang for years. There was a revival going on in London, and there was a preacher that was holding a tent meeting, and the preacher's name was George Whitefield. And perhaps you've read some of his sermons and teachings, a reformist. He tried to bring people back to the Word of God, what the Bible teaches. And this gang that this 17-year-old man in London was a part of, they had decided, we're going to go disrupt this meeting. We are going to mock and we are going to ridicule this man by the name of Whitefield. Well, as history tells us, the sermon that night that they went there to mock and to ridicule the preacher, the title was Wrath to Come. And this 17-year-old that has lived a life of rebellion is a part of this dangerous gang. It changed his life. And six years after that, he wrote these words. O oh, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee. May I still thy goodness prove while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. O oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am constrained to be, let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. That 17-year-old that went to that meeting that night that had a change of heart, his name was Robert Robinson. And he wrote... O oh, thou found of every blessing, number 420 in our book. So many of these songs that offer thank, thankfulness to God, thanksgiving to Him, that express praise to God and reasons to praise God, have very interesting stories behind them. I enjoy reading those stories. He realized, he came to his senses when he heard the Word of God preached. Jehovah is the giver of every blessing. We need to be content with what we have and that's not something that just comes accidentally. We have to work at it. We have to learn it. The same with being thankful. It's something that we have to learn. We need to remember our blessings from God. When's the last time you counted your blessings? It's something that we as Christians should do very often. Don't let much time go by before you count your blessings to God. Think about the fact that we deserve hell. 
We do not deserve to be in the presence of God. You know that one leper, then it makes the point that he was a foreigner. He did not deserve to be in the presence of God. But because of his cleansing, he could come back and be in the presence of Jesus Christ and get down on his knees at his feet and thank him with a loud voice what the Lord had done for him. A foreigner. Can you imagine the Jews that heard, heard of that? And that's in Luke 17 that we started out reading this evening. And it's interesting that Luke in Luke chapter 10 gives another example of someone that did the right thing that was a Samaritan, a good Samaritan. He's the one. He's the one that took care of the one that was left for half dead. Friends, do we realize that we, because of sin, we have an incurable disease, something that we cannot cure on our own. It's a terminal disease where it's leading to destruction. It's leading to hell. But by the grace of God, we can be cleansed. By the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross, we can be washed. We can be sanctified. Have our sins washed away and therefore can be in the presence of a holy God in heaven and saying, holy, holy, holy. You ever think about what an undeserving blessing it is that there is a Lamb's book of life and our name is in it? My name in the Lamb's book of life. Friends, I don't deserve such a blessing as that. Have you ever heard of the name Bobby Bowden? He considered by many to be the greatest football coach of all time on the college level. And I got to see him one time when I lived near Tallahassee, Florida. That's where he lived. And he was inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame and he read this poem that I wanted to share with you. To have your name up there is greater yet by far than all the Hall of Fames down here and every man-made star. This crowd on earth, they soon forget the heroes of the past. They cheer like mad until you fall. That's how long you last. I tell you, friend, I would not trade my name, however small, if written there beyond the stars in that celestial hall for any famous name on earth and glory that they share, I'd rather be an unknown here and have my name up there. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift of Jesus Christ. Don't live one more day with an ungrateful attitude to God. Get down on your knees and thank Him for your cleansing on a daily basis. If you're outside of Christ, there's still hope. You still have the opportunity to repent and to be baptized into Christ and have your sins washed away. If you need to come this evening, come if you need to while together we stand and sing.